Welcome, everyone. Today is July 7th, 2021. I can't believe it. We're in the throes of summer. I'm Trey Dobson, Chief Medical Officer at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and an emergency medicine physician with Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. And this is Medical Matters Weekly. It's a show about the aspects of healthcare that matter to you most. You can submit your questions on Facebook Live. And we have received some questions ahead of time uh, from wellness at svhealthcare.org. My guest today, I'm so excited, is Dr. Jeffrey Parsonet, who is an infectious disease physician at Dartmouth-Hitchcock and the leader of the Post-Acute COVID Syndrome Clinic, uh, which is a location meant to help those enduring uh, that are suffering and enduring with the symptoms of COVID-19. So, uh, Dr. Parsonet, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. We're so excited to have you, um, and we've had your colleague, Dr. Calderwood, and many others from Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Uh, let me just a little bit about uh, Dr. Parsonet. He, he has a bachelor's degree from Princeton University and then went on to NYU for School of Medicine, internal medicine residency at Yale, and then his fellowship in infectious disease at Beth Israel Hospital and Brigham and Women's <coughs> Hospital in Massachusetts. You've kind of done the Northeast uh, elite school tour there, Jeff. Well, I figure I'll retire in Maine and they can bury me in Nova Scotia. All right, perfect. <laughs> and you've practiced for more than 20 years. You're a professor of medicine at Dartmouth uh, Geisel School of Medicine, and you have several research interests which have shifted lately uh, towards uh, the new pandemic that we're in. Uh, but previously, and I'm sure ongoing, uh, you've worked with HIV infection, Lyme disease, and bone and joint infections. That's right. So just a little, so let's get a little background quickly. Um, I like when I have physicians on or nurses or other medical uh, staff, I like to hear about how they got interested in medicine. So what, what drew you to a career in medicine? Well, I have, I guess, sort of an unsatisfactory answer for you in that my two great grandfathers who were Russian immigrants uh, came to this country and went and worked their way through making gloves and hats and went to medical school. And they started the Newark Beth Israel Hospital in Newark, New Jersey. And there's my grandfather then became a surgeon in Newark and my father became a surgeon in Newark. So whenever people used to ask me, what are you going to do when you grow up? I'd say, I don't know. And they would kind of laugh. <laughs> I'm the fourth generation. And my sister's also an infectious disease doctor. So it, it kind of runs in the family. Well, that's great. Well, so then tell me a little bit about why infectious disease. Well, it's, that's a little bit interesting. So when I was a, a resident, I really didn't like chronic disease. I didn't like things like diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis and congestive heart failure where things go on and on. And I really like this idea of infectious disease because infectious disease you treat and either the patient gets better or sometimes doesn't get better, but eventually it's over, right? So right after I decided to go into infectious diseases, this new thing came out. Um, AIDS, we never heard of before. And then hepatitis C became, so now the rest of my life really has been taking care of chronic infections, uh, HIV, hepatitis C, you know, chronic Lyme disease type stuff, and now post COVID. So I chose it because I thought it was going to be sort of finite management. And now I'm doing this long-term management of patients, which I love. Right. And those are those diseases you, you just mentioned, they do have their acute component, but then they have this sequelae that can last. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail here on COVID-19. Um, but just back in your training, and I, I've had a couple other infectious disease physicians on the show, um, and we talk about part of your training, you, you discuss pandemics, of course, uh, but you don't anticipate uh, being in a pandemic, at least of, of this magnitude. Um, talk a little bit about going through your training and then what your feelings when it actually came about. And you can just elaborate uh, whatever you want on that, that question. Yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll develop something um, about this current pandemic. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Elizabeth Talbot, who is the uh, assistant state epidemiologist in the state of New Hampshire. And in January of 2020, when there was no cases of COVID in the United States or one case, she came to my office and said, this is going to be a, an event of historic importance. And I said, oh, come on, not really, you know. Right. And I was wrong, and she was right. You know, this is a pandemic like we haven't seen since 1918 in terms of its uh, manifestations. Um, I'm not an epidemiologist by training, so I don't have any specific training in pandemics. But certainly in my lifetime, we've seen a lot of new diseases. I mean, Lyme disease... It's not a pandemic in the strictest sense, but there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cases of Lyme disease. Uh, 
um, Legionnaire's disease was new in my lifetime. As I said before, hepatitis C, HIV, these are all things that sort of didn't exist when I started and have now become sort of the stuff that we deal with. You know, globally, the biggest killers, leaving out COVID-19, the biggest killers are malaria and tuberculosis, which we don't see much of here. Right. So it's almost as I was reading uh, yesterday, I believe it was, we, we use the word pandemic um, to, to look at worldwide prevalence, but actually uh, rich countries tend to get rid of these infections quickly and then they just are out there in the poorer countries. And hopefully we're going to learn from this pandemic and focus some of our efforts uh, on those countries. But we could do a, another entire show on that. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. In regards to uh, the virus in particular, though, I, I had a similar thing. It happened to not be an epidemiologist that came into my office. It happened to be my son uh, in January of 2020 who said, hey, do you see what's going on? This is going to be really big. And I said, no, it probably won't be that big of a deal. Um, and of course, I was completely wrong and found that out within a few weeks. What about this virus surprised you the most? Well, I think that's a really important question. And this is a coronavirus. And we've had two other coronaviruses in the recent past. One is called MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, and the other one was called uh, SARS. And both of these viruses uh, are very similar in their manifestations to COVID. There, there are differences, but they're very similar. But the big difference is that with COVID, people become infected with the virus and are asymptomatic for a period of time before they get sick so that they spread the virus during that period of time. And uh, they can even have no symptoms whatsoever throughout the course of their infection and spread the virus. So with something like the flu, uh, when people get sick, when people get infected, they get sick right away. So they stay home uh, from work. They, they, they don't spread the virus. But with this particular virus, people are spreading it without knowing they have it for a period of time before they get sick, or maybe they don't get sick at all. And that is why it has been a pandemic, because the only way to stop it is to isolate, isolate people, isolate everybody, um, so that it's not spread from person to person. That's been the big surprise. And that probably just gave you uh, chills once you realized that because you worked with HIV for, uh, for so long and still do. And that's another problem with HIV, that asymptomatic period allowing for the transmission of the virus. And I think people are understanding that now in the public. Um, but back in the spring of 2020, that was a shock and a big yeah, surprise. Well, and look, you know, it's interesting that last year there was almost no influenza in the United States, almost none. And why is that? Because everyone wore masks, isolated, right? But so for, for influenza, that works, but we still had COVID because it's so contagious um, in that period of time before people actually get symptomatic. Right. I think so, the other interesting thing about this virus that we're learning about, and which is the subject of today's talk, is how even when it's over, it's not over. You know, you get, in many cases, you get the flu and you get over it and you get other viruses and you get over it. But with this one, for many people, you're just starting. When did you first uh, realize that there were going to be these longer sequelae? Uh, well, that's an interesting question, and I have a. Uh, it's a personal thing for me because um, uh, last March, so March of 2020, I have a niece who's a healthy 36 year old who's a nurse at Vassar Hospital in Poughkeepsie, New York, and around that time was the first massive outbreak of COVID in New York City. And there were so many patients that New York City patients were being shipped out to, you know, New York suburban areas like, uh, like Poughkeepsie. And Vassar Hospital became a COVID hospital and they didn't have enough PPE. And my niece got COVID. Hmm. So she was not, uh, she felt terrible, but she wasn't that sick. She wasn't sick enough to be hospitalized. And after a week, her fever mostly went away. But then she tried to go back to work. And when she would walk up the stairs, walk in from her car, her pulse would go to 160. And she'd walk into the uh, nursing office to go to work and her temperature would be 100, 101. And this went on for a week after week after week. And she was not able to go back to work for three months. And nobody had ever heard of, I had certainly never heard of anything like that. She had what was then uh, not really understood, but now we call long haul disease or, or post-acute COVID syndrome. That is symptoms persisting for many weeks, often months um, after recovery from the acute viral stage. 
the virus is gone after a week or 10 days. It can't be recovered from people, yet the symptoms go on and on. So that's how I first became uh, interested in this uh, a little over a year ago. And then last summer, um, we start hearing reports of this on a wide scale from New York City, especially, which had which were the brunt of the initial outbreak. And it became of interest to everyone around them. Sure. And, and um, boy, we're going to just dive right into this. From a pathophysiology standpoint, um, is the thought, I know we have a lot to learn, uh, but is the thought that this is an inflammatory response, your own body's immune response that's uh, causing these, these symptoms to occur way after the virus has been cleared? Yes, it is. But, you know, despite the fact that, uh, you know, the, the best minds are working on this, the pathophysiology is really not understood. It is, it's not uh, because it's not just a systemic inflammatory response because people don't always have the lab tests that show inflammation and they don't have fever necessarily, but there seems to be something immunologic about it. There's a couple clues to this. Um, one clue is that post COVID, I'll call it post COVID syndrome, I might call it long haul syndrome, is much more common in women than in men. And women and men have different immune systems that have evolved over, um, you know, our period of evolution. And in the patients that we're seeing here, I would say just about 80% of them are women. And it's not just as some people say, oh, because women are more likely to complain about their symptoms or whatever else, or men are more stoic. There's a real biological difference. And that implies that it's an immunologic phenomenon of some kind, that the body remains revved up in some way and that that's responsible for the symptoms. But uh, we really don't know. Mm -hmm. We really do not have a good answer. Some people have speculated that the virus is still hiding out somewhere. Some people have speculated that there's little pieces of the virus that are still around. And uh, it's surprisingly unclear as to what causes this. Right, it's so elusive right now, but um, we remind ourselves and, and others that uh, we are in the very early stages. It's only been about 18, 20 months since this uh, disease was known to the world, maybe a little bit longer in, um, from its origins. And so we will learn more over the next year. And in fact, that's part of what you're going to be doing with this clinic, which I'll, I'll go into in, in one minute. I just wanted to remind the audience, and maybe you could comment uh, on this, Jeff, it, you know, almost all diseases and infectious disease, there is some small percentage of people that will develop uh, some type of systemic inflammatory response and have symptoms afterwards, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, streptococcal pharyngitis, the typical strep throat versus even, even influenza. But this seems to be different in the prevalence um, and the, uh, of you know, the numbers of people, the percentage of people that have developed some type of symptom way past when the virus should be gone. That's right. That's right. We're talking here, you know, it, it sort of depends on how you define post COVID, whether you're saying symptoms that go beyond four weeks or beyond eight weeks or beyond 12 weeks, mm -hmm. and whether you count as a symptom as uh, things still aren't smelling quite right to me right. versus uh, I can hardly walk, I can't go to work, I can't, which we're seeing a lot of. So you'll see widespread numbers from anywhere from 10% to well over 50% of people still are not right. Um, at least two or three months after having recovered, which is a surprising number since we all know that some people get COVID and have no symptoms or minimal symptoms. Some people have COVID and get all better in a couple of days. So it's really quite striking that such a large percentage of people are still not right after a period of months. Right. And, you know, one thing about in, in it's difficult and even for the individual who's aware, hey, I might not really be feeling these symptoms. This may simply be due to me, the anxiety of being through this illness. But when you start seeing actual diminished exercise capacity and, and other things that can develop, you know, we realize, boy, this is, this is real. And as you said, it can affect a large percentage of, of people. So tell us then um, a little bit about what symptoms that you're aware of that you see other than what you just talked about, about feeling tired, because there's the, the, the buzzwords in the media that the audiences have heard is brain fog and um, heart problems. And can you just go into some of those? Yes. So when we started this clinic, you know, we know that the virus gets in through the respiratory tract, right? And that the the thing that cause most severe illness acutely uh, and cause hospitalizations and deaths is, is respiratory infection, pneumonia and things like that. So when we started the clinic, I, the first person I called was one of our pulmonologists and said, you know, we're gonna start this clinic. I hope you're prepared to see a lot of patients. But we were wrong about that. 
Oh, because um, we've had very little of that out beyond the first couple of weeks. The lungs get better, and what we're seeing in the vast majority of cases is neurologic or what we call neuropsychiatric symptoms. And by that, I mean fatigue, but it's not just fatigue. These, these people are, many of them are exhausted. I have someone who's, a, who's a, a nurse practitioner who works 60 hours a week. And she says, now I have this and I have to take a shower in the morning. I have to take a shower in the evening because if I take my shower in the morning, that's it for me for the day. I really can't do anything more. It can be that severe. So can be profound fatigue, and then brain fog, by which people mean, I can't remember why I came into this room, which happens to all of us as we get older, but it's worse, I can't do numbers, I can't remember names, and it's, not, it's much worse than just, you know, what a 60-year-old start to get, right? I, I've been driving through my town in my car, and I can't figure out how, which way to turn from my house. Um, um, and then accompanying that, but separate from it are psychiatric symptoms of anxiety and depression. And it's not just that people are depressed because they can't go back to work or because they're anxious because they're out of work and they don't have money. There's some central thing that's happening that's causing anxiety and depression. And the, the whole way this occurs is not really clear, but what seems to be happening is the virus, which gets hidden you know, through the nose and the olfactory nerve, which is right there, goes right into the brain, is the virus is getting into the brain and in some way causing things to be disorganized. And you get anxiety and depression. You also sometimes have other kinds of nerve disorder, dysfunction, neuropathy. And one of the ways that this manifests is in something called uh, long expression postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or POTS. Mm -hmm. where people's, you know, we have two parts of our nervous system, the part that controls muscles that we can do, but also all the stuff that goes on in the background heart rate, blood vessel tone, breathing when you're not thinking about it, the autonomic nervous system. And that seems not to be functioning properly in many patients. And that can cause cognitive uh, dysfunction and malaise and other things. So really what we're seeing is mostly neurologic, long-term neurologic side effects from the virus. Wow. So I just learned something big, Jeff. I thought it would be due to endothelial disruption leading to you know, ischemia, uh, uh, brain ischemia. Um, and you're saying actual, uh, it, it, the virus actually invades in some way the, the neurons themselves. And I suppose we'll start seeing that in biopsy results. I'm not sure it's in the neurons or in some of the cells that surround the neurons, okay. the glial cells. I'm not sure that it's, it's, it's neurons. I'm not 100% sure about that. And, and interestingly, if you do special tests, like if you do a spinal tap or if you do um, EEGs, or if you do MRIs, these things usually come out normal. So there's something happening that's difficult to measure, but right. it really is a, is a neurologic, mostly neurologic thing. Now we're seeing, a, you asked about the heart stuff. You know, there are well-reported cases of myocarditis, inflamed heart in COVID, but it's really un, unusual. And, and we hear about cases of vaccine-induced myocarditis. That's really rare. Mm -hmm. And from what I've seen, uh, well, there have been, you know, someone's going to maybe better point out, oh, there was a death or something, but these are really rare and tend to recover completely. So most of the time when you do cardiac studies on these patients, they come out, they come out normal, which is reassuring. Right. And that's my understanding too. And they, or, and if they don't, if they're abnormal, they're barely abnormal and quickly normalized. Yeah. And of course, just to remind the audience, um, we don't hear about it much, but almost all uh, systemic viruses uh, will lead to a very small percentage of people in the U.S. or in the world that have some type of myocardial inflammation right. um, that goes away, even from the flu, uh, for right. example. So, well, when you mention these symptoms, uh, let me just ask, how does this compare? How do the symptoms of COVID, the, the post-COVID syndrome, compare with other sort of uh, newsworthy illnesses that have these long-term sequelae okay. like chronic fatigue syndrome and chronic Lyme? All right. Well, those are the two that always come up, and and it's a very appropriate question. And my answer to this would be uh, like most of my other answers today is that we really don't know. Mm -hmm. um, one of the differences with Lyme disease, of course, is that Lyme disease is a bacterial infection, and the bacteria are easily killed with conventional antibiotics. And we know that some people, even after a successful treatment of Lyme, have long-term symptoms. It doesn't appear to be due to bacteria being alive. Okay. The chronic fatigue syndrome is really quite similar in many ways. I, 
the the smell and taste stuff that's unique to coronavirus. It has to do with how the coronavirus gets in, right? The the COVID virus, and um, but in many other respects, they're they're probably similar. I haven't seen reports about about POTS, this autonomic nervous system dysfunction, in chronic fatigue. But my guess is that in studying this huge pandemic of post COVID disease, that we will learn a lot about uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and about uh, post Lyme fatigue and post Lyme disease, and that we will be able to apply things that we learn to, to those, those syndromes as well. The chronic fatigue syndrome, just for my understanding, is that still attributed uh, somewhat or, or theoretically due to Epstein-Barr virus and other viruses, or we just don't know at this point? We don't know, we don't know. I think the Epstein-Barr virus thing, not, but in terms of the other viruses, maybe. Um, you know, with, with the, you know, in retrospect, you, you can always see things that you didn't see at the time. When we see chronic fatigue patients, we often don't know what day it started, you know, when it started. It was insidious and onset. Where with COVID, they were fine, they were fine, they got sick, and then it went on. So it's a lot easier in that respect to study and to, to understand uh, than, than chronic fatigue. So yeah. tell us then uh, a little bit about this clinic and um, how it operates and, and what types of staff you have there and what your plans are for the future. Okay, well, thank you for that. So it's really not uh, uh, what people imagine in a multidisciplinary clinic is having a, a person come in and sit in a room and have all these specialists come in and, and listen to different parts of your body at the same time. So first of all, we started this clinic at a time when we were still discouraging people from coming to the hospital. So a lot of our patients were seeing by telehealth. But what we really have is it's more what I would say is a pathway of care. There's two of us, uh, there's me, and we have a, a nurse practitioner who recently joined me, uh, Christina Martin, who uh, also works with me. And we go over all the cases that are referred to us. And uh, review their histories, make sure they really had COVID, ask for additional information. And then we do an initial evaluation. And then we have a team of, of specialists that we've assembled who we then, if necessary, make referrals to. And that team basically consists of psychiatry, um, including neuropsychiatry for neuropsychiatric testing and neurology, who does the work on the POTS uh, syndrome, cardiology, which we've had basically no referrals to, pulmonary that we've had some, and then very importantly, uh, rehabilitation medicine, which consists of both physical therapy and occupational therapy, both of which are probably the most important aspect of managing these patients. So we started the clinic uh, barely three months ago, and since we didn't know if we were gonna get one patient a week or five patients a week. We've had a two, about 230 referrals wow. uh, to our clinic over a three month period. We're getting about 25 or 30 a week. And uh, needless to say, that's been um, quite a, a stress for us professionally and for my, uh, for my personal life as well, <laughs> I have to say. It's been really overwhelming. And, uh, you know, we hope it'll slow down soon. You know, the big peak of, of COVID was in November, December, January, February. So we're now beyond that. And there are fewer and fewer cases. And certainly in Vermont, I think, one day last week, there was one case or two cases of infection. So, you know, hopefully we'll see this slow down, but um, it, that, that's basically what we've been dealing with. And, and in answer to your question, it's a, it's a system of, of uh, evaluation and then referral to specialists as necessary within our system. And we try to get people seen as quickly as we can, but uh, it's been a bit of a struggle. Do you, um, and not to overwhelm you, uh, but for the physicians that are listening here and the other providers, um, healthcare workers, and the audience, uh, if they believe that they need to be seen or possibly need to be seen or one of their patients, um, where should they start? Should they start on the web? Uh, how should they uh, figure out whether or not this is right for them? Yes. Well, we, we like um, to have referrals from primary care doctors because once we've seen the patient, we would like to be able to you know, make recommendations to the primary care provider. So really, if from the patient perspective, it's best to talk to their PCP and to say, I'd like to be, I think I'm suffering from long COVID, I'd like to be referred. And then the referral comes into us. For providers, there are many ways in which people can send us, they can call. We have a dedicated phone number that's on the dartmouth Hitchcock website. You can follow a couple links and you'll find the phone number, or they can just send in a regular referral form to dartmouth Hitchcock, and, uh, and we go from there. Are you aware of um, of other clinics in, in New England uh, that are available? 
Yes, well, the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston has a very big one, and they've been helpful to us in getting started. I think there are some pulmonologists um, at University at Fletcher Allen who are doing this, but I don't think they have a comprehensive clinic, and I'm not aware of one elsewhere in New Hampshire or Vermont or in Maine. You know, interestingly, uh, I'm an infectious disease doctor, and many post-COVID clinics around the country don't even have an infectious disease doctor because it's not really an infection anymore. Right. But we had a need for it, and my wife said I had to do it. So there we go. <laughs> Well, bless her. That is great. And um, I imagine it's going to grow uh, despite the fact that the, the cases have trended down. I think that we will see more cases, um, hopefully not an expansive number. But and then, you know, hopefully what we will see and um, is that these post COVID type symptoms do uh, uh, dissipate over time, even with no intervention uh, and not persist, except within a, a small percentage, um, as you mentioned. So uh, just a couple more questions for you, Jeff. How, how is your niece doing? She is uh, all better, or almost all better. Uh, it took her really six months or so, but I think she's mostly completely recovered. Great. As far as, far as she tells me, she's completely recovered. Great. So you can go back to her morning showers. And yeah. then um, also, what you know, this is my favorite question of the day. What can you tell people uh, in the audience to help prevent uh, from, right. from getting yeah. long-term COVID. Yeah. yeah. So here's the really important thing about this that, you know, every day we hear, uh, oh, there are this many deaths, there are this many deaths. And, and people tend to think of COVID as, okay, so there's not many deaths. What people don't realize is that the bigger pandemic here is going to be post COVID. All right. Um, because COVID only kills a few percent of people, if that. But post COVID is a much greater number. And the amount of disability that we're seeing is tremendous. So the key thing about this is to get vaccinated. Okay, people who haven't gotten vaccinated and they say, okay, I'm not going to die. It's a big mistake because the post-COVID stuff, which many people get, is really horrible. But, you know, so many of the patients we're seeing are disabled. They really cannot function. And mm. not, you don't read about that in the paper very much, okay? That's not the statistics that the New York Times publishes. They say right. the deaths and the hospitalizations. So people who haven't been vaccinated, really, um, they should think about this indication for the vaccine. Absolutely. And, um, and it's very unfortunate hearing about these folks and, and they're starting to spread their word to say, hey, listen, this happened to me. You know, it happened to me before vaccine was available. Uh, but now that vaccine's available, please don't let it happen to you. Please yeah, get yeah, vaccinated. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're, we're out of time. I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Jeffrey Parsonet of Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, as well as Mike Cutler from CAT TV, uh, Ray Smith from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, and Ashley Jowett from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. Next week, uh, we're going to have Becca Filson, who is a nurse practitioner, and Lisa Downing Forget, who is a physician, and they will talk about diversity and inclusion efforts at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. You can send your questions ahead of time to wellness at svhealthcare.org. I'm Trey Dobbs. Go out and find joy in everything you do, even in the face of adversity, and we'll see you next week.